Mr. Director of the Nehru Science Center, all the colleagues that work in this center, and uh, the young generation of Indians who are collected here from various schools, uh, some of my earlier colleagues from the Nuclear Power Corporation, uh, members of my family and I, we are very happy to be here uh, this morning. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, uh, February 28, uh, I think it was in 1928, that uh, Professor Raman uh, 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 announced the discovery uh, that, of course, subsequently goes by the name of uh, Raman effect. At that point of time, he was working as the Assistant Accountant General, because, you know, uh, in those days, uh, um, dedicated scientists, although some of them were full-time scientists, some others mm, had to make a uh, living, as it were, doing other things. And so Professor Raman actually was working in the Accountant General's office, and he used to carry out his uh, in, uh, research interests in physics at the Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science, which is a, a non-governmental initiative in those days where uh, facilities were provided for scientific research uh, in the um, after working hours for some of the people who were otherwise engaged during the course of the day to earn their livelihood. So uh, Professor Raman worked in that institution for many years and uh, thereafter, of course, he moved to uh, Princeton City College and then to, the uh, to Bangalore to the Institute of Science. Uh, where he had a long association and eventually started the Raman Research Center uh, with his own initiative. Uh, I met Professor Raman for the first time in person in 1962 uh, when uh, my wife and I got married because he happened to be a good friend of the family of my parents-in-law. Uh, my wife's grandfather was Sir C.P. Ramaswamy Iyer, and he was a great friend of uh, Professor Raman. And so that is when I met him for the first time uh, in person. But of course, he was a great public speaker and would speak in uh, Bangalore and Madras and every other place. Very inspiring speaker. Uh, one of the great things about him was his uh, curiosity in many natural phenomena and uh, the emphasis he placed on cultivation of the uh, uh, scientific temper and study of science. For instance, he had carried out a uh, very interesting work on the science of music, especially about uh, the Mridangam. And of course, his uh, collection of butterflies and um, gems and so forth are uh, legendary. Even now, uh, all that collection is very much a part of the learning heritage that one uh, experiences when one goes through uh, the Raman Research Institute. Of course, uh, subsequent to Professor Raman, there have been other Indians who have also done very good work in uh, many areas of science and got Nobel Prizes. Of course, we know that the list includes uh, Argovind Khurana, Prasadesh uh, Chandrasekhar, who happened to be Professor Raman's nephew, and uh, Venki Ramakrishnan, because all these other people, of course, have done their work outside of India. Uh, some have had connections with India in their student days, others perhaps have uh, studied elsewhere. But the distinguishing feature about Professor Raman was that his work was carried out in India very largely, I mean, um, entirely, and he placed a uh, great, very great emphasis on uh, designing and building all his scientific uh, tools within the country, because he is a great believer in what is goes by the name of self-reliance, that you should um, configure your experimental apparatus, make them, build them, and uh, uh, you know, uh, move on to uh, studying new phenomena. Of course, this is not to say that uh, uh, we shouldn't uh, take advantage of, uh, advantage of the uh, more sophisticated techniques that may be developed elsewhere in the world. But Professor Raman worked at a point of time when 
uh, there was in some ways uh, uh, a certain degree of isolation and uh, the leading scientists of that time uh, had to work under great uh, uh, handicap but even then uh, he did uh, remarkably uh, outstanding work and which was rightly honored uh, with the Nobel Prize. Uh, from the days of Professor Raman, uh, we have, of course, uh, moved a great deal uh, in uh, many areas of scientific endeavor. Uh, we'll directly mention about uh, the great progress that's been made in agriculture and food production, for instance, which is a fact. Because there used to be a time when uh, we used to have great shortages of grains and cereals and so forth. Now, all of that is a past history because uh, we began to utilize science and technology in many activities of, the, of our life. Agriculture, for one thing, uh, power generation, uh, irrigation, uh, then uh, harnessing of uh, uh, other forces of nature. But more res recently, we have emphasized on things like solar energy, wind energy, and nuclear also became a very important area of uh, our uh, post-independence era. Uh, space, nuclear, uh, eventually uh, information technology. Uh, then, of course, a lot of progress in medical sciences, uh, extending the health of the people of the country. All of this has happened largely because uh, we believe, began to believe what uh, Jawaharlal Nehru used to call as a scientific temper, uh, approaching uh, problems of life from a scientific standpoint, uh, unburdened with uh, a superstition uh, or uh, too much of, uh, shall we say, um, voodoo, <laughs> which of course these days uh, we should be a little careful about uh, talking about that because uh, uh, not all old knowledge is uh, uh, useless. The old knowledge also is a foundation for new knowledge, but uh, new knowledge uh, be believes in reason, in observation, in uh, experimenting, repeatability of experimentation, and, and these other uh, disciplines. Now, uh, well, of course, uh, India has made uh, fairly good progress in using science and technology for its economic development. There is still a very great deal of uh, leeway to be made up. Uh, now we've got new challenges uh, on uh, our uh, air quality, new challenges on water quality, new challenges on waste disposal. All these uh, require uh, co continuing application of mind uh, based on uh, modern understanding of science and its, and its application to uh, solving day-to-day -day problems. Uh, when compared to the advanced countries, we have still a huge uh, gap and uh, in fact in some cases uh, many people tend to call for leapfrogging. That's what Dr. Saraba used to say that we don't have to go through uh, all the old steps that the classical societies have gone through, and but we can make a uh, faster catching up uh, by uh, eliminating some of the classical steps and then taking a big jump. Because in some areas it can be done. It's not easy to do it in all areas. But for, for instance, the progress that India made in information technology is one such. Uh, the foundations for the Focus of information technology had been laid down actually in the atomic energy program because the electronics uh, um, activities which had at that point of time been in uh, infancy, that was really encouraged a great deal to be grown uh, during the period of, of Dr. Baba and Dr. Sarabhai uh, when um, uh, we started to realize that uh, India would remain very backward if it did not move in this field of electronics. Now, uh, I'll try and cover some aspects of the atomic energy activities because that's what uh, I was told by your lecture that it may be of interest to the students here or somebody here. 
When we started this work, you know, way back in the early 50s, actually we didn't have a great deal of uh, organized industry in, in this country. And uh, even making simple things, we used to keep importing, uh, for that matter, bicycles used to be imported, sewing machines used to be imported, simple things like that were already being imported. Uh, but then that was because we had uh, 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 got into a situation of being a captive market for the British industry, and they looked upon India as a, a place where they can sell their goods uh, at uh, good profit and uh, generate wealth for uh, strengthening their own economic position. Now, so from that standpoint, the leaders of the early program in space and atomic energy, in both atomic energy and space, came and at one point of time under the same uh, leadership. In fact, up to Baba's time, uh, the space activities had been a small offshoot of the atomic energy program. So we said that well, let's do things where we will depend less on outside uh, uh, inputs and more on our own. So when we built the first uh, re reactor in uh, Trombek called Apsara, it was really a homegrown effort, but there was some, some input, very important input, of course, from Britain at that point of time. We had leased out what is called the fuel element, but the rest of the uh, reactor was really designed and built in India. And within a fairly short period of time, that was actually one of my earliest uh, uh, jobs I was engaged on when I returned to India in early 1956. And uh, it's quite nostalgic that in those days uh, we were able to put together uh, that uh, first research reactor uh, with a lot of Indian uh, inputs and uh, then I'd be able to put it to operation and uh, it was very important, the tool of uh, research, also a uh, facility for producing isotopes <laughs> for uh, medical and other applications. Of course, then we went on to build a much bigger uh, reactor, which is called the uh, Canada-India Reactor in cooperation with Canada. And that uh, had uh, uh, many more uh, uh, features, big reactor which could produce a lot of the uh, radioactive isotopes required for medical and other applications, and also for uh, carrying out uh, studies on fuels and materials, metallurgical studies and all of that. And both these uh, two reactors, Apsara and Cyrus, were uh, uh, our uh, foundational installations. And for a very long time, they served as a uh, uh, very important tools of uh, investigations in Trombe. Subsequently, we built uh, our own design reactor called Dhruva, uh, which is now functioning and uh, uh, doing extremely good work in, uh, <coughs> again, producing radioisotopes and uh, uh, platform for studies in fuel and materials and so on. I mean, all these activities, of course, uh, they're all what is called interdisciplinary. In the old days in India, what used to happen is we used to look upon physics as a one, one uh, box and chemistry as another box, metallurgy as a third box and so on. But all these frontier areas of technology now require interdisciplinary approach. It is you've got to have a knowledge of physics, chemistry, metallurgy, mathematics and all of that. And one of the important things that Dr. Baba stressed was that we should cultivate this uh, interdisciplinary nature, build teams of people coming from different uh, disciplines, and then they can be put on missions with certain well-defined uh, uh, tasks, and that, that task would be performed. So this is a new style of management uh, in India. But there is a point of time when, for instance, if you are an electrical engineer, you only did your fuse or your electrical switch gear or whatever. And if you were a civil engineer, you didn't even touch the junction box and uh, didn't, didn't even uh, know what was happening in the box of fuse. No, no, it's an electrical engineer's job. That was the old idea of uh, 
of, of uh, silos, as it were, as they call it these days, and that was breached. And then arising from that, in Trombe, we started the training program uh, very early on in 1956 or 57, I think it was, uh, when uh, uh, we had uh, people whom we recruited from different universities. There were people in physics, chemistry, um, biology, and uh, engineering in different branches, electrical, mechanical, chemical, and so on, metallurgy. And then we were giving them a common program so they would be oriented to take on the tasks that uh, uh, were uh, addressed in the atomic energy organization. In fact, the same kind of program has continued over a long period of time, and the training establishment has produced many, many very good people who have subsequently become leaders of the program and done great work for the country. Now, uh, one of the reasons why we undertook to start the power production program using nuclear energy is the fact that uh, we have a situation in India where coal is carried over long distances uh, from central India and eastern parts of India to other parts of the country and the coal is used for producing electricity. And the idea was that if you could reduce this uh, transport burden, that will be a good thing in itself and the railway and road capacity will be available for other purposes. Of course, that was the logic with which we started the program, but the growth of the program has been quite uh, slow. This is because in uh, 1974, we had uh, the test the nuclear test in 1974, uh, because that was dictated on the concern that we had for national security. Uh, in, before 1974 tests that India carried out at Pokhran, we only had the five major powers, which are also Security Council members, that is, say, uh, US and uh, then Soviet Union, now Russia, uh, UK. Uh, France and China uh, who had conducted nuclear tests, but then we felt that India's security concerns also had to be addressed, and that was the reason why in 1974 we carried out the tests in Pokhran. After the Pokhran test happened, then what happened is the Western countries, especially under the leadership of the United States, uh, enforced embargoes in India, and uh, they said that uh, we, we should not be allowed to have access the international uh, uh, supply of fuel or, 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 or nuclear components or equipment. And therefore, we had to have a big program of doing everything in India, this so-called self-trained program. And uh, I was initially uh, uh, connected with the first reactor program in Tarapur, which uh, cooperative program with the United States. And we built that uh, react in a very short period of time. Uh, it was uh, put into operation in 1969. And we've completed 50 years of service. And it'll probably go on for some more time. And it has been producing the lowest cost electricity. But one of the problems for that reactor has, is that the fuel, the kind of fuel used there is imported and has to be uh, obtained from overseas, because in those days, we had not had the capacity to make the so-called enriched uranium. But now, thereafter, we started to build other reactors in which we could use what we call as natural uranium. Now, there's a big difference between the two types of reactors, but uh, briefly put, what we can say is that the reactors that use enriched uranium have a simpler configuration because with a more concentrated fuel, whereas those with natural uranium have a very much more complex uh, elaborate systems, which also use another very special material called heavy water, uh, which of course is, available, is naturally found in ordinary water in a very small amount, and that requires to be separated in a very complicated process. So some of these things had to be developed in the country, and uh, all of this took a lot of technology and we have to create a lot of industrial capabilities to make equipment required for production of heavy water, of nuclear fuel, and so on. So 
the first project which we took up uh, where we use our own industry to supply equipment for this nuclear power station was in Kalpakam, uh, which uh, I had started. My, I started that work with back in 1967. And when we finished that particular reactor installation, India was amongst a very small number of countries that could actually design and build nuclear power stations on their own. It was a very uh, uh, <coughs> important milestone in our programs. And then following that, we have built a number of other so-called heavy water reactor power plants, which are in different parts of India. Um, in, of course, originally, we had a project with Canadian cooperation in Rajasthan, and subsequently on our own technology in Narora, in uh, Kaiga, uh, in um, Kakrapara, and, and so on. So all these, in fact, uh, one of our uh, heavy water reactors uh, in Kaiga has a world record of continuous operation, I think for some, some 982 days or something like that. It's very, very uh, creditable. And all these uh, reactors are supplying power at competitive prices. In fact, the, the cost of power from Tarapur is one of the lowest uh, in, in, in the Indian power system. So uh, the emphasis we made we placed on getting all these equipment made in India, also was responsible for making India uh, take up manufacture of all the other types of equi industrial equipment required for conventional uh, industry, like power station, chemical plant, and so on. Uh, and uh, for instance, when we started the space work, the antennas required for receiving the space signals, they were all uh, made in the country using our own uh, uh, scientists and engineers who designed them and who fabricated them in India. <coughs> now, the uh, <coughs> this is only one part of the activities of the atomic energy, that is the, the electricity production, but a lot of other things have happened where in the uh, Baba Atomic Research Center, enormous amount of basic science research has taken place in the fields of physics and chemistry and biology and their applications also. For instance, may, people may not know that we can use nuclear techniques for evolving new types of uh, seeds uh, which have got high, uh, uh, highly valued uh, properties like uh, ground nuts which have got big sizes, high oil content, and uh, 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 dolls like wooded, uh, where you get a higher yield, are uh, more resistant to certain types of um, pests and so forth, and are uh, accepting uh, more drought resistant conditions and so forth. A lot of applications are taking place there. Then of course, we also have got a lot of applications in the medical area with the isotopes of hospitals for treatment of uh, cancer for uh, both uh, detection and treatment of cancer. Uh, and that has been happening as a uh, big activity. Then in basic sciences, that is a uh, study of uh, the constituents of matter and the uh, study of the universe, uh, all, all of that has been spawned uh, on a wide front uh, over a long period of time. And now, you know, for instance, I remember when I had joined the atomic energy program, the total number of people that were there was only about 20. And then when I finished up in uh, 1990, the number of people had gone up to about 35,000. Of course, that, that included a large number of industrial uh, type of uh, people, also technicians and uh, 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 shop people and so on. But then the number of scientists had gone up to about 15,000 or so. So there's a very big growth that took place over a period of time. And the same type of tempo has been kept up uh, in subsequent years also. And now we've got a lot of international collaboration uh, to do with uh, the study of uh, uh, gravitational waves. It's called the uh, Laser Interferometer Gravitational Observatory that is likely to be set up here in India. Then other areas of uh, 
astronomy uh, uh, using radio astronomy as a tool. There's one f old facility in uh, Uti, there's a new, new facility in uh, uh, Pune, near Pune. All of these things have happened across a very, very uh, wide area of uh, uh, modern science. Now, one can ask the question whether a poor country uh, uh, should be concentrating more on only the basic areas of livelihood improvement and agriculture and so on, dairy and so on, or should it also go into new sciences? But I think the point here is this, that uh, you cannot really do one without the other. You've got to follow both the uh, basic sciences uh, and its application also, uh, those which are so-called societal programs, we to do with, let's say, desalination, to do with water management, uh, to do with uh, agricultural improvement. So I think we, both these things we got to keep pursuing. You cannot only say one will do and not the other. Now, in recent, uh, uh, we, we had, first of all, in the old days of uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, we had the first wave of uh, emphasis on education of a certain number of IITs and so on that it started. And then, uh, of course, the CSIR chain of laboratories was there. But one of the things that we have been finding is that the linkages with industry have not been as strong as you would like it to be. So uh, this is where uh, one of the weaknesses of Indian system has been, that although there has been good science in the laboratories, it hasn't actually translated to actual application in the uh, so-called marketplace, and so we haven't derived full benefits. So I think now the em emphasis has to be on this area of innovation, apart from whatever we learn in the lab, but it simply must be applied into practical products, into marketable products, into uh, activities that have a benefit on the life of the common people. It could be, for instance, extending the um, longevity levels of people so they live longer. That's happened, but there is scope for more to happen. Or in cutting down uh, malnutrition amongst younger people, young children, uh, or in ensuring uh, great, better hygiene, or better uh, uh, air quality. All these things are the areas where constantly we've got to have uh, the society's requirements in mind and. Uh, a, a mechanism to see that the basic knowledge gets transferred uh, to those areas where uh, there are unattended uh, uh, tasks. <coughs> now, uh, <coughs> I will now uh, touch upon uh, the uh, issue of uh, public acceptance of uh, some of these activities. So, for instance, especially nuclear energy, there is one of the issues that people tend to think is that uh, it's dangerous, that uh, somehow it's associated with the bomb. And therefore, there's a certain fear in uh, trying to uh, 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 trying to encourage more nuclear energy activities. Of course, the point is this, you see that all activities that we take on which uh, use modern science, there is a certain downsize uh, in the sense that there could be an adverse uh, uh, impact, but then that has to be uh, taken note of and then we have to overcome that uh, possible limitation. Uh, for instance, of course, when automobiles were originally introduced, nobody thought that uh, the question of uh, air pollution arising from exhaust uh, gases would be so uh, serious. Of course, now, after a period of time, we realize that that's a big downside of this automobile industry using petroleum fuel. And so now new methods of uh, uh, mobility uh, which would depend uh, on other types of technologies like using of uh, uh, electric vehicles. Uh, this kind of new developments have taken place. So you cannot really say 
that don't go and have mobility, just uh, depend on bullet cars and so forth. Uh, but then what one says is you, you develop a new technology that will address this question of the uh, adverse impact of an earlier technology. In the case of nuclear also, what has been happening is there is a, a great deal of uh, um, disinformation that uh, everything to do with nuclear is dangerous. Well, when it is uncontrolled, it is dangerous. But when it's controlled, it is possible to have uh, the positive benefits of uh, nuclear technology without uh, the adverse effects. Now, for instance, one example I can give you uh, on air pollution. Um, see, France, which produces electricity to the extent of about 70% from nuclear, uh, has had the uh, cleanest air and the lowest carbon emission uh, uh, on a per capita basis compared to other countries which have developed less nuclear energy. But then, of course, there is the new knowledge that was gained when this Fukushima ha accident happened in Japan and when a large number of uh, uh, people had to be evacuated from the surroundings of that particular reactor installation and uh, moved away and a number of reactors would be shut down for reassessment with its safety and so on. Now, we had a, a problem of that kind in uh, Kudankulam. Uh, you know, which one of these reactors that we are building with uh, Russian cooperation. And when we were building those reactors, uh, when they were actually ready to be started, we had a big local agitation. And the agitation was that the kind of accident that took place in uh, uh, Fukushima could happen here. But actually, what was missed out is that the kind of conditions that obtained in Fukushima did, didn't obtain in Purankulam, number one. And number two is that the design of these reactors is much more uh, up to date and they have provisions for cooling of the nuclear fuel under a whole variety of circumstances uh, without having the risk of uh, uh, an accident. So these factors had naturally not been adequately understood by the people at large, and then they agitated against it for a long time. And uh, all the work had actually come to a standstill. So then um, I was asked to head a committee by the uh, Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu, that then Chief Minister, Srimati um, Jayalalitha, to go and look into the safety, along with some other people, safety of this installation. and explain to the agitating people how the conditions here were different from what were there in Japan. And it took a long uh, period of time to meet various people and to bring some kind of an acceptance that uh, there was a big mix-up in the minds of people about this question. And really, the conditions uh, uh, in Kodankulam were totally different and they could not be the kind of earthquake or the kind of tsunami that, uh, that was experienced in Japan. So uh, the, 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 the public outreach is very, very important. And uh, the, the task of uh, some of my colleagues in the Nuclear Power Corporation and the Atomic Energy Organization has been to organize uh, public outreach to students, to school students, to college students, and so forth, and then take them around at the nuclear installation and show what, what is going on and how it can be managed in a safe manner. Because uh, the absence of knowledge is the biggest uh, impediment uh, to accepting a new, uh, uh, a new opportunities. So I think we should make sure that uh, we uh, underpin the general understanding level of society so that they do not uh, uh, easily get misled with partial information. That's very important uh, 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 outreach activity that we have to cultivate. Uh, now, why, why do we think that uh, uh, for the coming years to come, uh, we need 
uh, more uh, uh, science and technology. Well, I think uh, I, I could say this in the following way. Uh, if you look at the uh, longer term future, country, we still have many uh, uh, areas where we have to improve the quality of life uh, and uh, this includes uh, glo global warming challenges, climate change uh, challenges, species extinction, or exploitation of certain materials in uh, such of in, in, in scarce amounts for special applications like for instance lithium and then with the need to find new alternatives then of course there is a threat of new diseases uh, new viruses that we are now finding for instance so all these are all constantly happening now uh, mankind hasn't remained static you know many people tend to think that old systems were okay, etc. But then, at that point of time, the population was small. The expectations of society were very uh, simple. But then, as uh, the population increases, as uh, we urbanize more, uh, as economic activities increase, there are always new challenges that are coming up, and all these new challenges require enormous amounts of new science. And that is where all of you younger people assembly here today will have plenty of opportunities to look at whichever areas. For instance, there are many young students are taking a lot of interest in space, in robotics, in uh, information area, information technology areas to do with uh, all the new gadgeteering. And of course, we also require similarly um, science in these traditional areas. So uh, it is by continuous and conscious use of uh, scientific methodology that will be able to raise our uh, economic uh, uh, standards of living and also uh, to address uh, social, social, uh, societal problems. Let me see, malnutrition is one. Uh, um, underweight, underweight children uh, at, at birth is another. And then, of course, uh, disease prevention is third. All these require enormous amounts of uh, uh, scientific approach. But the impression should not be given that a man, a human being, should only have a single-centric approach to science alone. He must also have a holistic approach to appreciation of arts, of liberal arts, of music, of uh, uh, dance, of uh, painting, sculpture. And, and all of these, for instance, Dr. Baba was a great collector of uh, paintings. Uh, one of the best collection of uh, modern Indian paintings was with the Department of Atomic Energy in the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. And, and Dr. Sarabhai also was a great connoisseur of art. And eventually, many of us who worked in that environment continued to promote this idea that we must look at life in a holistic way, both uh, 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 being conscious of the importance of science and methodology of science, and also with uh, the appreciation of the art. Because you see, a man doesn't live only by bread, as people say. You need to have an all rounded uh, approach to life. <coughs> now, uh, there are some, of course, people who uh, tend to overplay one or the other. But I think uh, that is uh, somewhat of a uh, narrow view. A broad view would be that uh, you must look upon uh, all activities of, uh, 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 of a human being as uh, a whole one and encourage uh, both kinds of activities and machine for a, uh, a, a life that is more full, a fuller life. Uh, uh, a more uh, eventful life. Otherwise, we'll only be stuck with uh, uh, a narrow view of things. Now, uh, <coughs> I must, of course, refer to, in passing, one very important uh, uh, 
political kind of initiative that took place. You know, I was mentioning to you that India remained in an isolated mode in the nuclear field for a very long time. That happened from practically 1974 to almost uh, 2000, or so about 25 years. Thereafter, we had a, a new uh, uh, diplomatic initiative uh, with the United States, whereby uh, India could uh, re-enter uh, the international uh, arena in, in the nuclear field. And that took a number of years of negotiations between India and the United States. Uh, and eventually, of course, uh, we had agreements with the uh, US and uh, France and Russia in 2008 and later on with other countries also. So we are now able to get access to uranium and nuclear equipment from outside of the country. Uh, and so that has been a new dimension which offers uh, scope for more rapid expansion of uh, nuclear power in this country. Of course, uh, actually, big projects have yet to take off. What's happened, of course, is we are cooperating more with Russia. We expect also to have some cooperation with the United States and France to have big uh, nuclear power stations. Of course, we also think that uh, nuclear uh, units could be built in smaller sizes with, with, with limited applications for remote areas. For example, if you want to have a nuclear power, and a, a clean power in a place like Andaman or Nicobar, you could think in terms of a nuclear power station there. And these require special small designs, and these are also being now explored. So uh, the uh, <coughs> objective, therefore, has been to see what are the opportunities available to use all these very large amount of uh, basic scientific information and, and laboratory techniques to a wide range of uh, problems of, uh, of the country and of the society. It seems to me that uh, a lot of you young people have, um, will have many, many opportunities for uh, uh, your creative talent uh, in years to come. And I urge you to consider uh, you know, cultivating uh, future options in all these new areas like uh, space, uh, atomic energy, information technology, uh, new materials, uh, and, and uh, of course, also uh, used in medical areas, so called bioengineering these days, engineering techniques used in medical areas, and then uh, remote. Uh, uh, telemedicine and things, things like that. So I think many of these op options are, were not there at all when you were young and uh, when you people are all growing up, the whole lot of new options are uh, appearing in the scene and I think you can all have very interesting uh, challenges in these areas. So I, I wish all of you uh, success in your uh, future uh, uh, career aspirations. Thank you.